So today we're talking about one possible contribution to getting our, our citizens' roofs over their heads without bankrupting them. There are 168,000 vacant properties in Ireland according to this year's census. Now, it's probably less than that in terms of some of them would, would not be available for use. But if even one third of those were brought back into use, it would make a big dent in the numbers of people who are longing for homes of their own. It would also have the effect of revitalizing towns and villages all over the country and creating a real context for the now very popular remote working, something none of us knew anything about before COVID, but now very popular. If you add in 22,000 derelict properties, that big dint gets much bigger. The win-win of affordable housing and environmental revitalization must be obvious to our politicians, civil servants, and local authorities. And in fact, it is, because just in time for our session today, they announced a new scheme where they're going to provide grants. They obviously knew we were going to lacerate them on the stage here <laughs> and decided now is the time to break the news to the, 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 the Irish citizens. So there's a new scheme, and Maggie and Kieran uh, and, and Tom will talk a little about that in the course of our deliberations and let you know what, what, what is in it for you. So many of you will have your spirits lifted by the RT TV programme, Cheap Irish Homes, possibly the most cheerful offering on television <laughs> over the last two years. It cheered us all up during COVID. Smiling, hopeful Maggie Malloy, <laughs> on my right here, invites people uh, in search of their forever home, as she loves to call it, to view three properties, all under 200,000, some as low as 30,000. I must say, the eyes came out of my head when I saw this programme first. I couldn't believe it, that you could actually buy a house as cheaply as, as you guys were, were offering it. it was so hopeful. They go and visit each property where they encounter engineer Kieran McCarthy, who's over here in the middle, who looks with his beady expert eye at each house <laughs> and advises them on what needs to be fixed. It's very often the chimney. Kieran says, that will be the chimney, and indeed it is the chimney, <laughs> causing water to ingress into the house and cause all kinds of trouble. Um, and he's very good at giving advice about, you know, prices and so forth, what, what you're going to need to do the house up, which is really useful stuff to get. The buyer is usually young people with no hope of owning a house in a city make a choice. We sometimes get to see how they have fared in their new homes, and it's like a fairy tale. It truly is a wonderful program, and you've, you've made so many people happy and got them somewhere to live, which is just splendid. We count on our local authorities to lead the way in the housing struggle. Many have been sluggish in this regard, hanging on to state land on which houses could be built, and seeming not to get the fact that a whole generation is being denied what should be a basic right. But not Tom Gilligan, uh, furthest away from me here, Director of Services at Mayo County Council, who's on a mission to restore vacant and derelict buildings as living spaces. And he's willing to talk about it, not always a given with public officials. He's also created a user-friendly <laughs> website for reporting vacant and derelict properties. You'll all be taught how to do this today and just have a, <laughs> cast your beady eyes around your districts and see what needs to be reported. So Tom, in my view, is the model of a proper public servant, and we're delighted to have all three of you here with us today. Now, we're going to start, Mike, with a short clip of Cheap Irish Homes. Then I'll talk to Maggie and Kieran. And then we'll have two clips for Tom. Uh, one part of an interview he did with Duncan Stewart, the king of Irish environmental broadcasting, with that worried look on his face at all times. <laughs> uh, and the other, a demonstration of the Vacant Houses website. Then I'll chat to him. We'll try and have a bit of a group engagement after that, and we'll have time for questions from you. So, Mike, if you roll that video... Uh, for Cheap Irish Homes. That would be great. I'm Maggie Malloy, and I'm on a mission to shine a light on the hidden side of the Irish housing market. Everybody just drives past them and thinks there's really no potential in them. I have a passion for matching up house hunters with old boxy bungalows, forgotten farmhouses, and keenly priced properties. The things that really stuck out for me was the fact that it has all of its services, which is good. I too struggled to get on the property ladder, but I found this old farmhouse for 80,000, and after years of hard graft, I now have my forever home. In this new series, we've upped the budget to cast the net wider and reveal the great value that's out there all over the country. For advice along the way, I'll be relying on my building engineer, Kieran. I really get and appreciate why she's bringing people to these houses. These places are being neglected. It looks to be fine. I mean, I wouldn't go changing it unless there's a problem. I'm excited to show you what's out there within a reasonable budget and help get a roof over people's heads. Cheerful. <laughs> Immensely cheerful. So, so the downstairs is split uh, into a couple. Maggie and Kieran, how do you go about finding the homes that you want to offer to your prospective buyers? 
A lot of phone calls. Yeah. A lot of phone calls. Mm. I think, I mean, people generally who come on the show with us, they, they're having trouble with one very, very specific thing. It'll be maybe they, they want to live somewhere they can't really afford to live there. We kind of have to open their eyes a little bit. So generally the criteria they give us in the very beginning isn't necessarily exactly the house they will get because there's a reason they're not finding a house. Like I firmly believe there are affordable houses out there for still a huge amount of people but you just have to open your eyes a little bit. You have to kind of realise that having an up-to-spec house isn't for everyone. It's not something we all are going to have in our lifetime, but you need a house, and you do deserve to have a house, and you can make a lot out of a house, to be fair. If you just get it, get in through the door, get the bank to give you the money, <laughs> and then figure it out from there. <laughs> so is it phone calls to estate agents? Yeah, I mean... Hundreds and right. hundreds. And there's a team of us that do it. Like, it's not yeah. just it's myself not just you. <laughs> ringing yeah. everybody. No, we have yeah. a great team, don't we, here? Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, they do so much. It's a, it's a lot of chasing down houses, trying to figure out what houses are not on the market yet that are coming on the market that we can yeah. hopefully try and wangle our way try into. Try and snap up. <laughs> exactly. And I presume estate agents are happy to collaborate with you and to, to give you they information. They are now. Are they? Not so much <laughs> they in season the start. one. No. Right. <laughs> season one, it was kind of like, who who wants to come into the house? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now even when I do my YouTube stuff, I'll ring and I'll want to get in to do a house tour and they'll be like, is this for the show? <gasps> is this for the show? <laughs> They're just made up then. And not realising that like the the house will be on the television maybe six months later so yeah, it really is I mean it does give positive advertising for them so if the house hasn't already sold by the time the show goes on they have a really good chance of getting it sold so I feel like it is a win-win for well, them well actually you know? it has to be because you, only one house gets taken mm. in each programme two more don't exactly so yeah. the, again as you're saying if it isn't sold that's, that's an ad for, the, for those yeah, houses of course. So where yeah. people can see that they might grab them up um what are the major issues, Kieran, about doing up these houses? I mentioned the chimney and water ingress and so on. Uh, what, what would you find to be the scariest thing that, that would show up? Uh, well, like, scariest? I, I always, when I look at a house, the first thing I kind of look at is the roof to make yeah. sure the roof is in reasonably, because the roof's good enough condition. It means it's held out water then, so you can expect when you go into the inside, it's in fairly good condition, might okay. need to be modernised, or will, will need to be modernised. Um, but, like, I mean, any house, any older house is going to have a... The roof only has a lifespan of maybe 70 or 80 years anyway. Like, right. if it's a thatched roof, it might have been slated. If it's a slate roof, it might have had asbestos beyond that and whatever. So, so roof doesn't last forever because, um, because it's timber, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, like, the scariest thing... To see, for me, isn't the roof because I go, okay, the roof's shagged, the roof right? Fixed, okay, it, yeah. you know, it was it, at some stage it left me fixed anyway, so it just hasn't, happens to be no. But like, if you see a big crack the whole way up a wall, yeah. the walls are the thing, like, because the walls should last almost forever, and if okay. they're in trouble, then the house is there's a lot of you know, you're 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 you're, you're, you're hoping to find something good that you can rescue, yeah, and you're hoping that the walls are in reasonable condition because then you go right, we put a new roof and we start looking at the inside and plumbing, electric, and all that, but. If the walls are in trouble, you're kind of going, Jesus. And would you turn down a house because of that, <laughs> that it, it looked too far gone? Uh, there's been few enough, really. Like, most yeah. of them, because, like, okay, I mean, I'm here as an, as an engineer and builder. You know, it's easy for me to go in and go, ah, look, it's not worth doing this or worth doing that. But, like, my job on the show is to, sh is to show you how you can feasibly yeah. rescue it, right? Now, obviously, if it's too far gone, I will put up the hand and go, look, lads, I think we're struggling here, right? Um, but generally, I'm there, look, it's not as bad as you think. The walls are reasonably good, Nick. If the roof's in good condition, it's great. I mean, some of them have actually been in, like, some of them are walking condition. Not many, yeah. no, but there are some that are actually perfectly turnkey mm. and reasonably well insulated in the whole lot. Mm. You know, it really depends on what you and see. And still there. under 200,000. Mm. Yeah. You said you've expanded <laughs> the budget for the, the next season. What does that mean? Are, are, are you going for houses that cost a little more than that? Um, well, I mean, not... Not over 200 Not normally. Over 200. I mean, like, sometimes people will have the budget of over 200, but yeah. I don't like pushing people over that. Yeah. Like, I, I still think maybe it's just because I'm someone that was given 110,000 on my mortgage. Yeah. I think 200,000 is crazy money. Yeah. And I, I think we all should be able to get some sort of a house for yeah. under 200. Yeah. And to be honest, the people that apply on the show, even if you do get mortgage approval for 250, a lot of them don't want to spend mm. it, do they? Mm. They really mm. don't, you know? So I think 
with the way housing has gone up in price and building materials and stuff have gone up in price over the last couple of years, I feel like it's more about value now. It's like getting value for the money mm -hmm. that the person has because they can go and they can take their 200,000 and they can go on a waiting list for a semi-detached house and a housing estate or they can go and spend half the money and just by moving slightly outside the town they're in or the city they're in. And I think that that's, it's about the value, I think, really. Yeah. You know? And do you find that people like the idea of an older house? You know, because a lot of the properties you get are quite quirky. Mm. They're, they're interesting places. You know, you can see ghosts flitting about and, you know, all sorts of <laughs> nice things happen. Yeah, fairies um, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. oh, definitely. No, it, fairies it, at the bottom of the garden. Honestly, it, there's a certain set of us out there that yeah. love old houses. Yeah. That, and I think... You do. I mean, oh, yeah, you, that totally. Comes across really but strong. I genuinely thought I was yeah. on my own for yeah. years. I yeah. did. People thought I was nuts. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh, my God. I'm very nostalgic and very sentimental about this kind of stuff. I was raised like that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it was because we were raised in a house where we didn't have the money to super modernise everything. We had to kind of make do. Mm -hmm. We lived in a very rural area in an old house. And my granny lived in an old house. My two grannies did. So it was just very normal yeah. for me. And I think... It's only from doing the Instagram feed originally that I realised other people really are like that as well. And we've walked into houses before, even myself and Kieran, where there'll be young people, maybe early 30s, late 20s. And I remember in the beginning, Kieran would be, oh, right, we'll knock this wall down and we'll put an open plan thing here. And I remember this one girl walking in and it was just this tiny little cottage outside Limerick. And she just said... This is the very same as my granny's house. I love it exactly as it is. I wouldn't change a she thing. She didn't want to do anything with no, it. No, because oh. it, it is, there is a sentimentality there. Yeah. I think the generation above us has these kind of memories of growing up in the houses when the houses were cold and damp. And there is a very kind of like almost like a kind of a, a shame to the houses yeah. a little bit. And they kind of um, represented a kind of a sense of poverty, I think, because you hadn't built your bungalow but I think for our generation and the one below me, it's where your granny lived and it's where you went on Sundays and it's where you were given sweets when you weren't meant to be having sweets. The sweets are the thing. They are. They <laughs> are. <laughs> but that's, I think that's it. There's a definitely a more of a fondness for these houses in the younger generation than anyone gives them credit for. That's really encouraging, isn't yeah. it? And sometimes, Kieran, you, you give an example of a house that has been brought back into into use. I've seen that once or twice on the show. Yeah, that's where you can show some of the prospective buyers this this is what you can do with this kind of house. Yeah, that that segment was brought in on the the second, the second uh, season. season. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there's like eight shows, and Maggie does four renovation shoots, mm -hmm. and I do four where uh, people who have renovated their house show us around. Yeah. They show photographs of what the house was like before. What is the house like now? Um, and sometimes they might have lived in it before and everybody else, and, um, and, it, and we talk about uh, what was the journey like. You know, of course, at the end then, was, was it worth it? Yeah. And, uh, and how much did it cost? I mean, and some of the prices are... Rock oh, bottom. Like, shockingly low. Like. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's, but that, I mean, but you always see, think this is going to cost the earth, and it doesn't. It, it really depends on how you do it. Like, because when I started, I mean, I, I built houses, we, we renovate houses, or we, we, we used to renovate more houses, we more kind of build houses now. But, um, so I'm used to kind of someone hiring a contractor and building it all in one go, right? Which is the most expensive way to build it, right? Um, direct labor is cheaper and doing it over years, mm. depending on your savings and cash flow and all that kind of thing. Is kind of cheaper again. It's it's more um, affordable, I suppose, because yeah. you can you, rather than taking out a loan, you you get a few bob and you get some work on the roof do done. Do it when and, you can do yeah, it. Yeah, do out yeah. the last room and everything else. But like, when you get into the gearing of, okay, we do need to insulate it, but we don't have to insulate it this year. Yeah, we'll do it in a few years' time, and meanwhile, we'll use this room and not this room. And the rads are working at the moment. We know they won't last forever, so we'll do it on the road. And it took me a while to get into that kind of gearing. It's because not what you were used to. But no, once, once do, and I yeah. knew we were working with low budgets um, and in houses, so obviously we're going to look, work with low budgets in terms of um, the regeneration or yeah. repair of them. And uh, and, pe and people, ha and they had to, have, you know, it was important to Maggie that the houses found new home, that the new homeowners and they were brought to life and, and rescued and all that. So it took me a while to kind of understand how we could actually realistically do this yeah. for these lower construction budgets and make it work. And, um, and eventually we kind of worked it out. Yeah. So would you, like, suppose somebody, I, I remember one house that, that you showed which had been restored in exactly the way you're talking about it. 
that this woman had bought this house and done it slowly. I think it might have been three or four years before she was done. It was beautiful. I mean, it was, and I couldn't believe how cheap it was. Mm. Can you lay out for people what they need to do with the house when they buy it? Or do they, what, like suppose somebody buys the house, you say you need to fix the roof, you need to do this with the radiators, whatever. Um, they would then have to hire somebody to do all that, presumably. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, do, or do it themselves. Or do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. what, what I've seen on, in the renovation tools, which is the ones we're talking about there, you know, the, the before and after, like where they're making huge savings is rather than buying a brand new kitchen, which could be 5,000 euros, 6, 7,000 euros, they find one undone deal and they go, well, look, we can kind of make this work. It's a second-hand kitchen. We can clean it all down. It's, it was only three years old anyway when someone changed a mind or something. They buy it and done deal for hundreds rather than thousands. Which is ecologically sensitive as well. Mm. Better yeah. again. And they, they just make it work. Mm -hmm. And they buy um, second-hand furniture and they get end-of-lot tiles. and like, But they're prepared to make it work rather than just go, I went off and bought it. You know... <laughs> There's a lot of head scratching, and they're they're very crafty people, and you know the the, the savings are staggering. Like I mean, I I, I, was, I said it at the start, I couldn't understand how they were doing it so cheaply, and it's remarkable. And I think that's one of the great takeaways from the program that this mm. can be done oh, yeah. Yeah. without breaking the bank, that it's all possible, and it must it must be so satisfying. Do you ever go back and see them? Afterwards, the, the people who bought the no, houses. I, ha I haven't. I mean, I get the people who buy the houses get in touch with us and tell us how they got on. You know, so that's yeah. lovely, lovely yeah. to see. You know, I think it's a bit of a maybe a COVID knockback for all of us that we're just <coughs> kind of not going yeah. out like we would have back in the day and just kind of randomly yeah. turn up at someone's house yeah. and so. Yeah. But um, I would like to say about the thing Kieran was saying there a minute ago as well, though it's not just about buying secondhand stuff, and I need people, especially young people, to realise that. It's about coming into a house and doing as little as possible to get it yeah. comfortable. That's a really, really big thing. Like coming in, like my house that I live in, I got into it, I put new doors and windows in it. My roof was fine, mm -hmm. right? I got one <coughs> chimney rebuilt, which I paid 1,500 euro to get rebuilt by a local builder, right? <coughs> Other than that, my house is exactly the same on the inside as it was. Yeah. I left my ceilings up in my rooms because they were fine. My walls were lime plaster on some of them, sand, sand and cement on others. I whitewashed them. Mm -hmm. the, the rooms got dressed with nice stuff. The doors got glossed with new gloss mm -hmm. paint. You don't need to do a massive amount. And yeah. it's almost like the people who don't have the money to do this massive renovation job on a house are the people that bring them in under budget. Yeah. So those people we see in those renovations, they didn't have a choice. Mm. They had maybe 10,000, 30,000 or whatever to spend on a house. Whereas you can see people come in and spend 160, 170, and you're like, you could have built a house. And right behind them is Dermot Bannon. Yeah saying, it's going to cost more than that. But, you know, I wouldn't even mind if you were at least getting a Dermabannon house yeah. at the back of it, but these people, they end up <laughs> yeah. with a cottage yeah. that's the same yeah. footprint as the house they had, and you're like, what on earth did you spend that you money on? That. No, it's almost yeah. like the people with less money tend to renovate more softly and more yeah. sympathetically because they can't afford to pull the innards out of the house and start again, yeah. really, you know? Yeah. It's, 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 I mean, there's a huge conservation thing here mm -hmm. going on with, with what the two of you are doing, which is, is, is really wonderful. We had Valerie Mulvin here last year, the architect, and she has written a book about the, the towns of Ireland, the, the old towns, with their beautiful squares, you know, okay, which lovely. are places like uh, Clonmel and Mallow and Mitchellstown and all of that. And she wants those to be revitalised and living above the shop. And we've been talking about living above the shop for 100 years, really, and nobody ever does it. <laughs> there were more people living above the shop when I was a kid than there are now. Yeah, yeah. And it's wasted space. You look up and there it is. You know, yeah. Again, yeah. We, we have to think of smart ways to deal with the housing crisis. And I think the stuff you're doing is brilliant. And I wonder, has it increased the, the market for those kinds of houses? Do you know that or not? That are, are more people trying to buy cheaper houses in the countryside of oh, the sort absolutely. that you're advertising. I think not yeah. only that, more importantly, more of them are coming on the market. Yeah. Like I'm in Tipperary 20 years. I'm from Wexford. So I drive up and down Tipperary yeah. to Wexford a couple yeah. of times a month. And the houses I've passed for 20 years, some of them are now coming on the market. Okay. Loads of them are now rented where people who owned them who couldn't sell them have just gotten them back on the market and gotten them rented. Yeah. And the numbers of the empty ones are slowly getting smaller and smaller. Okay. 
And like we will see ones coming on even daft. I would browse daft all the time. Like I'm just, it's like my Bible. <laughs> and we, we all do, anyone who's looking for a house. And I'm not even looking for a house. But you just, you live on things like that. You live on myhome.ie as well. And you tend to kind of just, you know the houses in your area that you've always went, oh, imagine if I could live in that. Imagine if they sold that. And then one day, boom, it's on daft. And in a couple of weeks, it's gone and it's sold. And they are coming up now, I think farmers and stuff like that are starting to realize that these little ruins that they would think they are at the ends of their lanes and stuff are actually worth something they're worth money to them but also to young people i think they probably thought sure who'd live in them yeah. i mean what they're not worth but you're proving they can yeah, yeah and so. i think it's a kind of a necessity that young people are moving into them but i think it's a great credit to young people that they've just went I live there. Yeah, I can do that. And you're so proud. Like when you get yeah. into it, yeah. you have a house with no front door or half a front door like me. The top half I had, not the bottom half, because that would have been very Irish and I would have loved that. <laughs> I had the door. top half and a bit of a stick stuck up against the door frame to hold it closed. And I remember just coming into it that day and just being so proud that it was my house. And I, could, I remember cleaning out the fire in one of the rooms and lighting a little fire and sleeping in that room and just being like, you're delighted with this. And I think... People look at these houses and think, sure, how could you be proud of that? How could you? But like, guys, we don't have a lot of choices and we're, we're proud to get any piece of land or house that's ours at this stage, you know? We're having a, a wonderful um, session uh, tomorrow on homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, which is tied in, of course, the housing crisis means a homeless, homelessness crisis. And one of our guests is Claire Dunn, the actress who was the star of oh, yeah. Kin with her wonderful birthmark under her eye. She made a movie called Herself, and it's about a single mother who builds her own home for 30 grand. And it's all there on the screen, and you can see it. Horrible things happen, I won't spoil it for you. But it ends on a hopeful note, at least. Okay. But uh, it's, again, it's another way of approaching it. She could not find anywhere to rent in the, the current time. Two little girls. And she got the plans online from this guy, and somebody gave her a back garden, and she got her friends to help her build the house and got, got a Kieran type chap to be in charge of everything <laughs> and boss them all around and tell them how to do and health and safety and all that was done. Um, so there are, there's such lovely hopeful stories out there. Mm. So look, we, I'll move on to Tom now for the, the, the next part. So Mike, if you could roll the interview with worried Duncan Stewart <laughs> uh, and the, run, run the, one, the other one directly after it, please. Thanks, Mike. Mayo County Council are one local authority where I have heard some real efforts are being made around vacancy and dereliction. They've been proactive in this area and have recently innovated with a new website for logging and tracking vacant homes, an idea inspired by their Director of Services, Tom Gilligan. When I see dereliction like this, is it that people don't want to live in the town or is it that there's no demand for housing in the area? Recently, um, there was a report that, that came out um, that indicated that in Mayo, there was only about 23 properties for rent in the entire county what? Of, of Mayo. And how many people are looking for houses? You know, we have a housing waiting list of, of just under 1,400 people. So you have people not only on the social housing list, but you also have people, particularly now with COVID, we have people remote working who are coming into the county, who want to live here, who want to work here, who want to establish roots here. Uh, so, you know, the need for housing is becoming more and more acute. So what can Mayo County Council do about this problem? There's a number of things that's what we're doing at the moment, Duncan, and I suppose if I can take you to this property here, which is the old Garda, Garda Barracks, um, and this has been vacant since 2007, recently acquired by Mayo County Council. So our plan is to turn this into social housing. Well, it's great to see Mayo County Council taking on these projects and restoring these buildings, but is it the solution to the big problem across Ireland of dereliction? It, it, it's part of the solution, Duncan. We need to look at broader leverages as well in order to encourage owners of vacant property to bring them back into use and one thing that that i would advocate and, and i think is being looked at by the government is the whole issue in relation to a vacant home tax and i think in a sense that vacant home tax will certainly be the first step 
in order to encourage more and more people to bring homes back into use because bringing properties back into use helps create additional revenue streams as well you know brings more people into town it increases footfall so it's a win-win for everyone and now how to register Have you noticed any vacant homes in your neighbourhood? Letting us know about vacant homes in your area is easy. 1. Simply visit the website www.vacanthomes.ie 2. Fill in property address or, if you are standing near the property, use the Geolocation button. 3. Answer a few questions about the property, only if you can. For example, how long has the property been vacant? Is there a for sale rent sign on the property? Is the grass around the property overgrown? 4. Include photographs of the property by uploading them directly or by taking photographs with your phone while at the property. Be sure the geolocation is enabled on your camera phone. 5. Contributions to vacanthomes.ie can be made anonymously or by using your email address to create an account. 6. Creating an account will allow you to log in and view previously submitted properties. Congratulations, you have now successfully helped us to identify a vacant home. Thanks to your contributions on vacanthomes.ie, hundreds of houses and apartments have been brought back into use. These provide real homes for people with very real housing needs. Thank you for playing your part in rebuilding Ireland. And it's, it's sort of a Snoop's charter in a way too, you know, in the sense that that, that bugger won't sell this house. The family are fighting over it. Uh, that's been sitting out for all these years. Let's put um, a light a fire under them and see what happens. And of course, uh, Tom was advocating for the vacant uh, home tax. And that too is part of the government's plan. Right. Apparently in the autumn, Pascal Donoghue was going to introduce yeah. it. Let's hope it's a big hefty tax and not just a tiny amount of money. We want to scare people. So Tom, um, tell us the kinds of, uh, you seem to be, I think, operating mostly in the three big cities in Mayo, Castlebar, Ballina, Westport. Westport, would that be right? Yeah. yeah. And we saw an example there of the, um, the Garda Barracks, yeah. which looks a substantial property. You get quite a few nice homes out of that. What other kinds of properties have you been dealing with? Well, I, I, well first of all, I suppose, Katrina, just to say that Duncan isn't as serious as that. He's, he's actually great crack. I know he is. <laughs> with the camera's <laughs> off. And I that. like that he looks he, worried. He, <laughs> 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 yeah. But uh, no, yeah, I, I mean, in Mayo, I suppose, we, look, like most counties in the west of Ireland, we, we do have a particular problem in relation to uh, vacancy and dereliction. I mean, the last, well, Sorry, the, the census in relation to 2016 identified uh, over to, roughly around 10,500 yeah. vacant homes in, in Mayo. Now, I suppose the good news is that uh, the, the current census, 2022, identified over 9,000. So in actual fact, in Mayo, where the average drop in the number of um, vacant homes nationally was 9%, right. we actually recorded a 13.5%. Okay. Decrease. So we're actually very, you know, very, having an effect. Very, very happy that that um, we actually kind of did, did better than the, the than the average. But I suppose what we're seeing, all right, yeah, you're seeing something like in relation to, you know, the the, the old guard barracks, and you know, you've other places as well, like military barracks, and you have a number, uh, particularly in relation to um, just a number of one-off houses as well, mm -hmm. and houses in towns. Right. You know, and when I started, I suppose, when I started the website, and it, it's kind of funny because when, when Maggie was talking about her story there, and I kind of had a similar background because I was, I was born in, in, in the UK, um, but my, my parents, both my parents come from Leitrim. And when granddad died at the time, I was about five or six. So mum and dad came home and granddad had left uh, dad uh, a house. Now it was, it was... It was a house in probably in four walls and a roof, and that was it. But um, so we moved back to Leitrim anyway, and um, we stayed. I stayed with with Grand for a while 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 the house was being done up, and it was done up kind of a room at a time. Yeah. So that was sort of where kind of kind of my passion for kind of vacancy and dereliction came from. I suppose it came from that, that kind of early age, of of um, 
been involved in it. And I could see, I mean, as 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 Maggie here alluded to, I mean, the pride in in doing of something yourself. Yeah. And it was sort of it was. I suppose really it was over nearly five, ten years, probably ten years. It was, you know, we were continually doing and adding, putting in extensions, you know, just making sure, I suppose, in a sense, just bringing it up. And then, you know, um, my other siblings came along then. And, you know, it was it was just great to see, but it was just that real, real labour of love. And I suppose that, that whole aspects of dereliction and vacancy has kind of has kind of kept with me all right. But, and the more I, I like... When I started the website, it, it was around, it was at the latter end of um, 2017, so that's how you, the, the Rebuilding Ireland um, at, at the time. And it was that idea that we, I was out walking one day and it was this house that was vacant. And I just happened to, I bumped into, the, into a neighbour. I just happened to say, well, do you tell me why this house is vacant? It was, it was relatively new. And they were able to give me sort of chapter and verse as to why it was vacant. And working in a local authority, I suppose the advantage I have, and others as well, my colleagues as well, is that we're at the cold face of the, the local community, you know. And local people have local knowledge. And the idea of the website is it's, it's crowdsourcing. So it's the idea of getting, getting groups of people together to provide that information because they have that information. And that can be the key to un unlock the potential around a vacant home. And the other thing as well, apart from the obviously the, the fulfilling the housing need, I also found as well that actually bringing vacant homes back into use, there are a myriad of benefits around it. One is in relation to it does create employment, yeah, because you know as Kim would say, you know, you know local builders, local contractors, so you have local hardware shops as well benefit, and also as well it kept you know, but the more people you get into an area, it increases the footfall. So it protects our local schools. And that's one thing in Mayo, I suppose, in a sense. We have a lot of, you know, rural houses and rural schools. And, you know, trying to get people into those areas, children to go to school and, and that. And also the other thing as well, which is becoming even more and more prevalent at the moment, is in the whole area of climate change. And there was a report that was conducted by, by, by a group, I believe, in Scotland. But they, they calculated that um, doing up a vacant property actually was, you know, you were saving 70% CO2 emissions in relation to doing a vacant property. And when you think about it, that makes perfect sense because you already have your footpaths, you already have your road, you already have your utility connection, um, you know, in relation to uh, water as well, you have your street lighting, particularly in relation to towns and villages. So it, to me, it, it became a win-win-win situation. And in my job... I mean, the, the happiest and the proudest day, days in my job is when you do give someone a key to a home, you know, uh, and they move into that home for the very first time. And it, it literally is, it's, it's, it's transformational, yeah. you know. And, and especially the, now with, with oh, absolutely. so many people getting hopeless about it. Oh, yeah. You've got people living with their parents into their late 30s. That, that, that's really wrong. Absolutely. It's very poor yeah. social yeah. planning. It's not fair that people should have to live under those kinds of pressures. But, I mean, the, the, the reason we're having this discussion today is, is, I think, I was so surprised by what I, I learned from watching Maggie and Kieran's programme yeah. and then seeing that interview with you, with, yeah. with Duncan Stewart, that there is hope and, and there are ways of doing these things if people are able to be patient, uh, they don't have to bankrupt themselves to, to find somewhere yeah. nice to live. Now, in terms of the properties that you're working on, are, are you doing social and affordable housing or just social housing? At the moment, I suppose in Mayo, it's, it's all around the social, yeah. just the, the social um, aspect of it. You know, we are actually uh, applying to the government in relation to an affordable housing scheme, yeah. but we Mayo isn't one of the counties that... Um, is listed uh, as one uh, county that's been applicable as was for, for an affordable housing scheme. Yeah. But in saying that, we have to recognise as well that there are certain parts of the county that there are affordable issues. So, for example, I can give you Westport, yeah. where the average prices of houses uh, and apartments in Westport would be higher there than other parts of the county. Yeah. So it's I think beautiful what, town, what like yeah, exactly, it's exactly, and it, it you know once it was, you know, um, Irish Times voted it the best place to live in Ireland, you know, 
and that does attract people and it does attract attention, which is great. But it does have that impact as well, I suppose, where it has increased prices. So we, we were in, in the middle at the moment of, of putting an application together to apply to government that uh, Westport will be um, a town that, in particular, so that will have an affordable scheme. And if we can do it in Westport, then we're looking at other parts of the county. Once, to, you, to, once to you break the barrier, I suppose. I, exactly, can, exactly. But we wouldn't be the others. only one. I mean, I mean, I can, you know, you can imagine in, in Kerry they would have Killarney, mm -hmm. that would be a, a very much a sort of tourist focused yeah. town, and that's something I suppose in the sense that that um, they're probably putting an application together as well. But I mean, you know, it is it is a tragedy that in the in the in the midst midst of a housing crisis that we have all this vacancy yeah. and dereliction. Mm, yeah. Like, there's no doubt about it. And one of the frust frustrating things for me is that, you know, we have a census that, at the moment, I suppose, is giving us a figure of 166,000. Mm -hmm. We have the geo directory that's giving us a figure of 90,000. And um, then, I suppose, we have the revenue now with, their, with, with the, 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 the tax, which is given probably in the region about, you know, uh, 50 or 60,000 yeah. uh, properties as well. Why so, are there such variations in yeah, the, the numbers? Yeah, th th that's the thing. I mean, that yeah. is one of the frustrating things. Well, well, you know, you could argue, I suppose, that with the census, the census was done um, back in April, I suppose, that that's a moment in time. The same mm. with in relation to revenue as well, I suppose, that that's another moment moment in time. And the geo directory, I suppose, is, is, is a... Is a is a kind of a constant live figure, but th that that is the frustrating thing that we can't all agree a kind of uh, methodology around this yeah. as to what exactly is vacant and you know how long it's vacant. So you know, and that does create those confusion. And you know, we really do at this stage. And one of the things, one of the hopes around it, something like vacanthomes.ie, was to try and gather a, a data set, a yeah. robust data set that that you know, would be able to be live at any moment in time. You know, look, we have a long, long way to go. But I suppose the hope is at some stage that there will be um, 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 a, 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 a sort of a, data, a database that will That's actually, reliable. That that's reliable can, and accurate and that people can actually, you know, you know, be more transparent and more open as well. Because, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what we need, I think, you know. Yeah. We... You know, people talk, and then they talk about the the normal levels of vacancy. You know, well, in every, you know, it's either between two and six percent. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's nothing normal about a housing crisis. No. You know, that's the reality of it. And, you know, uh, and, and it's we why need... it's so mysterious. You know, yeah, yeah, this has been going on for a very long time now. T too long. And too long. Uh, it has affected a whole generation really badly. Oh, absolutely. And it does seem yeah. very mysterious that it cannot be solved. I mean, in the 1930s. Ireland built more housing than any yeah. other country yeah, in yeah, Europe yeah. as fascism was rising in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were building houses like the good time and beautiful schemes, really nice places to live. Exactly. Um, but I so we can do it. You know, we we just, can do it. but have to I decide to do it. It's probably harder now because at the time, I suppose, you had... I mean, there are much more limited resources now, I suppose, in the sense that at the time you had, you had... You probably had more land, you know. Now, yeah. now you know, we have, do have to look at things like density as well. Yeah. You know, we do have to start looking at maybe building up as opposed to building out. Yeah, we do. Um, and People are know, very attached to their front and back gardens. Yeah, there is that. And there we, is don't, that. we don't really yeah. have a tradition of apartment No, we here. don't. We and don't. the apartments that have been built are not up to snuff, whereas we're finding out now. Well, that's the thing. A two, a well, two yeah, billion yeah, yeah, bill yeah. for the taxpayer you know. from bad building. Yeah. That's shocking. Yeah, Nobody it is. Regulated. It is. So there's all of that. Anyway, we can cringe and, forever. And just, uh, just on the other things, also, you talk about a bit, but it's also another problem that we have in Mayo as well is the whole issue in relation to defective concrete blocks. Yes. Which pyrite. is pyrite, yeah. Pyrite, And yeah. turning all the mica. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a very complex issue. I don't very know complex. why they're not hammering the construction industry over the mica <laughs> stuff. You know, we all have to pay up. And I know that the, the people who who made the blocks are suffering terrible attacks on social media. Yeah. Stay off Twitter, basically. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Better think for your health. So, yeah. But uh, it is remarkable that, 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 again, the taxpayer has to foot the bill for stuff that was yeah. done yeah. by people who should have known better. And, of course, it's because of lack of regulation and inspection. Well, I suppose it was part of that whole Celtic t Celtic Tiger aspect was, as well, yeah. you know. And um, yeah, it's, it's all grand well, it's, until it's, the place starts falling down around your yeah, ears. You yeah, know? yeah. So... Um, there was something I wanted to ask. Oh, Tom, before I finish with you, 
Are there other local authorities doing what you're doing? Is there a Tom Gilligan in every county? <laughs> I, no. I don't know if there is a <laughs> No <with> the <laughs> <laughs> But I know the, 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 there are a number. Look, in, in fairness, you know, a, a lot of local authorities, in fairness, are, are, are dealing with, with aspects of, of vacancy <clears> and dereliction. Um, it, but it is, it is a difficult and it is a complex issue. You know, yeah. like I work very closely at the moment with, um, with my colleagues, my, my fellow directors of service, also the vacant homes officer, officers as, as well. And, and I mean, there is now, I mean, the government has stipulated that there will be a full-time vacant home officer in each um, um, uh, local authority, which, which I think is a, is a very, very positive thing. As long as they appoint them. Yeah. But what you can say things and not do them. Well, they will work, I suppose, and one of the things that they're, they're working on at the moment and uh, is, is that of, of working with people in relation to, uh, you know, bringing them through the process. Right. You know, and there are a number of schemes at the moment. I mean, I mean we, 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 we'll talk about the, the new uh, 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 Creek Conaha Town scheme, but also, I suppose, you have the, the buy, renew, and the repair and lease, mm -hmm. which is, I suppose, very much focused as well on getting owners, um, you know, to to um, get their property back into use, you know, with, with the stipulation obviously that they, for a minimum of five years, that that they provided for for social housing. But, you know, and at the time I suppose you know the, the amount involved in that was forty thousand. Thankfully, the the government have increased it to sixty. I, I think at this stage now, with with hyperinflation, we probably need more. Yeah. Um, because I still think one of the problems is, is that thing of lack of finance. Mm -hmm. Of people actually not being able to, um, they haven't have got the, the wherewithal to do the place. They don't, and, and they're getting. Yes. I mean, one one guy in in, um, in he, you know he he had two properties in in um, in Mayo, and um, he wanted to, to use the repair and lease scheme, but um, the quotations he was getting getting back was like you know one hundred fifty two hundred thousand. No way to do the that, property, yeah. you know. So he didn't have, you he know, needs he needs Kieran he, to go and see yeah, him. Yeah, he, he he wanted to do, to 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 do it, you know. Um, and of course, you see, we, you know, they have to be at a certain, they have to be at a standard, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's not a case where you can do a little bit here and there. Mm. It has to be standard in relation to. Well, that's you know, the problem. Like when, you, like when you, when there's grants involved, it has to be brought up to a certain rate to current regs and all does, that. Yeah. And if you bring yeah. current regs into it, then the whole lot of it, it you're it, dense, it, Exactly. Yeah. Bureaucratic exactly. chaos. Yeah. 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 Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. Now, I want to get your views before we go to the audience, or all three of you, on the new scheme that the government has announced. Um, Kieran was being very. Uh, informative back, backstage before we came on about the kinds of different the different kinds of grants you can get with this one added into it. Mm. So maybe tell us a little about that. Um, you were talking about the retrofit grant and the various other things. Yeah well the retrofit grant is, is up to 30,000 mm -hmm. um, which is uh, um, well that's the, the, the grant for doing up derelict buildings but you have um, there's other grants available then like you have SAI grants. Yeah which are deep retrofit grants, which are up to 20,000. So, I mean, there is a variety of, uh, of grants available. Now, you'd be surprised, as Tom was saying, going into an old building, if you were to do the whole mm, lot exactly, and yeah. do it up to today's regs and everything, you're into <coughs> mountains of money, and the 30,000 and 20,000 mm. will only be a, be a small you know, drop in the half ocean. of what you're looking for at yeah. best, you know. But, but it all helps, certainly, you know. But, I mean, you, with, with all these projects anyway, like we mentioned earlier on, you have to really look at how you're going to do it because if you start reading architects and engineers and builders, you're into major money. Mm -hmm. If you just take a step back and, and look at how you could renovate it in phases and what you can upcycle, and you know, because mm -hmm. a lot of people who, who will be built, buying an old house have that little bit of that mindset anyway. Mm -hmm. They're not looking for the three-bed semi or the brand-new house out in the country and all that. Mm -hmm. So... But I mean, there is, like we, like we've kind of, we, we've almost for, because everything is so disposable and you can Google this and Google that, we've almost forgotten what you can actually do if you take a step back and be a bit more careful with your money and a bit more, a uh, bit of ingenuity. Um, yeah. Like the, 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 I suppose we're hoping with our show anyway that, that that has shown that you can do more with less, but you have to think outside the box a bit as well. Well, even listening to what Maggie told us about her own house mm. was yeah. fascinating. That she's, she kept it more or less as it was, and it's, it's, it's paint and new windows mm. and, and doors. 
And, you know, that is not a hugely expensive undertaking. No. But uh, it's, it changes the, the house. But that is the kind of mindset you will need going into some of yeah. these houses because to. there is yeah. grants available, yeah. but and yeah. it's great yeah. to have grants available, mm. yeah. but they're not mm. huge, they're not and huge. the money yeah. could yeah. be huge unless you're a bit more careful about how you yeah. spend it. Yeah. You yeah, you kind of, I think you kind of need to know how to spot a house yeah. that only needs that. And yeah. when you can start, and even, I suppose between the time when myself and Kieran met and now I think even you can spot a place a lot differently now than he would have in the beginning yeah. where I'd come in and go I actually love this house I think it probably needs to be emptied out given a good scrub yeah. lick of paint your own stuff in it and it would make a massive difference and Kieran yeah. was like well <laughs> I don't know and you know it, took, it kind of as we went on I think he's yeah. kind of he's realized that like you know, I, a lot of what I would do with this would be just because I had to. You know, yeah. I do love it as well, but it, also I had to do it. And I think if you can spot a house that has a good roof, that has relatively solid walls, you know, it's dry, the floors are in relatively good condition. It's like, I mean, half of the country looks down on a cement floor. And like, I've had cement floors in my farmhouse for 20 years. Yeah. They've been in it since the, it was built, probably. And it's perfect and yeah. it's fine. It does the job. The money it would cost me to pull them up, I just wouldn't even dream of it. It's and there like, are rugs. There are rugs mm. and carpets rugs exist. and yeah. lino. Bit of All lino. sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Lino's coming back into fashion again. <laughs> of course it's it great. is. <laughs> so let me just check on the time now. It's probably running away with this a bit. Yeah. I think we'll go to the audience. Uh, do we have our roving mic somewhere there? <laughs> Anybody want to ask these geniuses a question? <laughs> about what to do with their house. Up here on the right, there you go. Lovely. Hi, thanks a million. It's a very interesting conversation. I'm just wondering, you've touched on it a small bit. Are we regulating ourselves out of a solution? Because I'm just sitting here wondering, if Maggie was to use her house for to lease it, would it meet the spec of the regulations? I'd it's say, all to be honest, my house wouldn't meet any spec of anything <laughs> in the world. Yeah. yeah. So I, I haven't been invited to make it. No, yet, there's a reason. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't invite that people. That day is coming. It's like you know, yeah. you know, but like I mean, I don't want to interrupt you now, but I think it's a really good question, and I was going to say it even when Tom was talking earlier. I feel like there are so many stipulations and regulations mm. on houses nowadays. There's even a rule that if you um, renovate more than a certain percentage of the envelope of your building you have to take the whole house up to essentially NZ B2. yeah B2. B2 so what that means for a lot of people is if you change the roof you're gone yeah so there you are going right well look I can't renovate my house if you decide you want to insulate two rooms and not insulate the other two B2 you're exactly back and this is it so what it's actually doing is for people who are on middle incomes mm -hmm. because to a certain degree low-income people are looked out for it's these middle income people where you're basically telling us we can't do up our houses at all so we need to just live in cold damp houses it's like yeah. yeah. it's just it's crazy you we are getting regulated out of it completely i really I think. think so and yeah. so therefore i wonder what is the point in all of the new grants and all the grants that are available but can't be taken up because it's unaffordable yeah. at the end of the day for the person who is quite happy to live in a house that's renovated or repaired to a certain yeah. degree. Yeah, the yeah. regulations do make it difficult. The, mm -hmm. the new NZ regulation, which came in in 2019, just before COVID, um, which Mike said, like if you renovate more than twenty percent of the external envelope, you've got like to bring low. you have to bring the whole building low, like. up yeah. to. Um, to a it B2, doesn't make any sense no. to me, no. um, and I wonder what can be done about that. It's well, all well, very the well. The reason was brought in was to just for, for, for climate action um, and then to make the whole the housing stock more green and reduce emissions mm -hmm. and all that sort of things. Uh, so, so that's good, but it is expensive. I mean, particularly now with building costs, or insulation's gone way up and all that kind of thing. So. Um, and even now they're, they're, they're moving away from gas. Uh, they have moved away from oil. Like as of this year, you can't build a new house and fit an oil boiler. Mm. In three years' time, you won't be able to build a new house and fit a gas boiler, which means you've got to use air to water. Yeah. Um, and you said that the other day when we were filming, we were doing the show the other day, and there was an old oil boiler, mm. and it was in a house where like, an older person had had it fitted in a spare room, and mm. Kieran was like, you can't have that. Like, it needs to be outside. And one of the crew said, well, look, do you just go and get a new one and put it outside? And Kieran was like, well, you can't do that. You can't. You know, they're trying to get people away from buying them. So Kieran was like, well, just go air to water, which is that new 
shiny technology that works quite badly in old vernacular houses because there needs to be, in order to get the grant for air to water, your house has to be up to a certain level of air tightness. And that means, basically, with an old vernacular house, is that you have to basically build a second house inside the vernacular house, <laughs> which costs a fortune. Mm. And then your house, is, which is already quite a small house to begin with, gets smaller. And then you, you've no way of checking on the stone, whether it's damp, whether your walls are breathing properly. Yeah. It's crazy. They're trying to get the house to not breathe, but those old houses have, have to, to breathe. breathe. So yeah. basically what happens with people with old houses is you don't get the grant for the air to water, so oh God, we have we no heating. Off, off so so we have no heating, <laughs> right? We're, we're down to no heating in the houses oh, this now. this is terribly sad. You know? It's well, it, it, it's, it's a mire of regulations. It is. And the regulations are crazy. Like, yeah. it's all great, all this great new news, and we're giving out all these grants and everything, but they're actually not and achievable, achieving, attainable. I, I don't think that'll change, you know? Um, so, like, what's the solution? There's all of these derelict buildings all the way around the country, Get people living in them, great, it's a great idea. But we're making it impossible. Uh, well, I suppose the, grand, the, uh, the, the, the deep retrofit grants anyway probably aren't enough. I mean, 20,000 yeah. 20, euros sounds like an awful lot, but you actually, I mean, we, 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 my own house, we renovated last year and we got the deep retrofit grant and uh, we, um, to actually get it is a mountain of paperwork. Exactly. You get audited. Um, and you've got to take up all the floors and put down new heating pipes and there's a world of insulation and air tightness and all that. And you have and to get quotes from all the different builders it. who know you're getting a grant. Well, there's that so as well. Yeah, the different quotations are going to come in. Yeah. 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 And yeah. nowadays like, they won't even... The sorry, quotes will the be like honoured for maybe a month because prices are rising yeah. and rising mm. and rising. Yeah. So, yeah, it is. This is depressing. <laughs> sorry. About something else for a <laughs> this happen? It's so true, though. It's so true. This is meant to be upbeat and cheerful. <laughs> but it's real. I feel like it's real. And I don't think there's any point in not talking about this because no, this is right. the reality of it. Yeah, it's really and it's, it's a bit... Yeah shitty <laughs> and it is mm. it's not fair and I feel like everything that's done to these derelict houses and to us in rural Ireland is always shrouded in oh it's greener if you guys don't live out there it's greener if you put all this stuff into these houses while at the same time you've got like towns pumping sewerage into the environment and have been doing it 15 years over the time they were meant to and yet we're in trouble because we well, and we, we all our septic tanks need to be vetted before they're put in, and it's mm. it's just it's two rules. It's one rule for one and one rule for the other. But I mean, like, like like Maggie and I have this kind of debate on a regular on a regular basis when we're looking at an old house. But like, there is a benefit to putting in insulation in your house because it reduces your Absolutely. carbon emissions, sure. and it's a one-off mm. payment. And once you've paid the extortionate price of the insulation your heating bills are reduced forever and your carbon emissions are reduced forever. Mm -hmm. But so there's nothing wrong with insulating houses. It's a great thing to be doing, but it has to be made affordable. And it also, like from the point of view of the show, uh, it doesn't have to be done as soon as you buy the house. Yeah. Now, often people do, they go, look, I'll do it all in one go mm -hmm. and then I'll move in. Fantastic, if you have the money. If you don't, you don't have to do it year one or year two or year three. You might come up with a program that works and go, well, look, I'm not going to do an insulation straight away. I'll probably do it in year three. I know the roof's in trouble. I'm going to do the roof now because, you know, we have to, obviously, yeah. for every reason, Essential. keep the weather out. Um, and when I do the insulation, I'll probably do the boiler as well or whatever. So, you know, does it, think of what needs to be done um, and when you can do it and when you can afford to do it because you don't have to do it all at once. And that can make it much more um, affordable, I suppose. You know, well, I think it's, I suppose that the, the one loophole in all of this is that, that the, the sort of thing that you're doing on the programme, you're giving people a chance to buy a house themselves, which they can do up at their own pace. Mm. So they don't necessarily have, they won't get grants, obviously, if they're not going to meet the fantastic regulations that are imposed. Mm. But uh, they still can do that and live in their houses. Uh, without incurring um, a huge bill that they wouldn't be able to pay. But the important thing is, like, which we touched on earlier on, not all the houses are in huge trouble and need mm. worlds of yeah. money put into them. Like, yeah. these houses are cheap because the demand for them is lower than the demands for mm. houses in Dublin and Cork, that kind of thing. So yeah. some of them are just cheap because there's little enough demand, but the house is almost fine. Yeah. Or like mm, yeah. bungalows um, which don't have the same kind of character as uh, the lovely old cottages or whatever. They're easy to renovate. Mm -hmm. They're cheap to renovate. Most of them have cavity walls. So, uh, mm. so you can pump, in, like for 
three grand, you can pump insulation to the wall. Into the walls, yeah. And you get a grant of a few hundred for it anyway. And that's not, okay, okay three grand is three grand, but I mean, like, to insulate a house and, and blow insulation into the attic for another two grand, for five grand, they're insulated, like. Yeah. Um, so I don't have any great love of bungalows, but they're, 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 easy, they're, they're easy to renovate. And uh, there's not a whole lot that can go wrong with them. So that's well, now we're back into hopeful territory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are ones of them out there be. that you can live in. I think the trick is you need to get your mindset around to what you can live in. Yeah. I really think that's mm. it. It's the difference between walking into a, a show home and going, oh, this is lovely, this is what I deserve, mm. and actually going, well, look, I don't want to be in my parents' spare room till I'm yeah. 50. I want yeah. to have kids. I want to have my own life. So I'm going to compromise here on something, you know? And like a house, I would look at a house and go, I could live in that. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily do that. But I'm still looking out for, is there a septic tank in it already? Is there a well? Yeah. Is there a good roof? Is, is it weather tight? Like I'm not moving into a barn with yeah. no door on it. Like I am actually being relatively sensible here. And that's what I did with my place. The roof was good on my place. And I knew that was the biggest expense I was ever going to incur was going to be that roof. And it was a huge house with a good roof and no windows and no doors, but they're not the most expensive no. thing to replace. Well, so. you know that. It's actually yeah. knowing this, yeah. which is what you're doing for us wonderfully on, on the, the show. We have time for one more question, if somebody would like to Sorry, ask. Sorry, guys. Gentleman up there <laughs> on the right. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, really great conversation. Um, I think the, the underutilization of, of properties in the dereliction is, is an absolute crime. It's, it's just ridiculous in a housing crisis to, to have it. Um, to Tom's point, um, a huge fan of the, the carrot and stick approach to force people to, I suppose, use it or lose it or, or, or be taxed. Um, but to Tom, uh, on the register of properties, say, that you have and, and speaking with the maybe the owners of the properties, if, if you do do that, what, what are the kind of reasons they're giving for, for sitting on derelict properties? Because if you go around the towns, you, you don't see for sale signs on these on these derelict properties so what what's what's going on what kind of reasons are given for 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 sitting on on derelict properties and not doing anything with them yeah no it's it's, it's, a, it's a great question and, and you're right um there are a myriad of reasons um i suppose one of the one of the main reasons that come well there are a couple of reasons but one of the key ones comes back is that people have an um, an attachment to a property so they might have been left that property from, you know, from uh, maybe a relative, you know, a close relative, a, a, a mother or father. And they're reluctant to do anything with it because they feel as though that they, you know, that they're, I suppose, they're, 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 they're saying, Jesus, you know, I, I'm attachment to this, you know, my, my parents wouldn't want to go out, out of the family name. So that, that's one of the, well, that's, that's, that's a, a, a popular reason. The other reason is too is when, when, when people, when owners die, um, they mightn't have their affairs in order. So, you know, it can go into probate, which can take, you know, which can take a, a length of time. The other thing as well, that um, if a property is left to a family, so what I mean by that, there could be, let's say, three or four siblings, and the siblings mightn't agree as to what to do with the property. Um, Two of them might want to sell it. The other one might want to not do anything with, and the you know the the, the final one might want to, to live in the property them, themselves. And the other most popular one is around the whole thing of finance that they don't have the finances to um, to do up the property. I I, I one of the, I remember, never forget the time I was down at the ploughing championships one year, and I was doing uh, I had a stand up in relation to the whole vacant homes. And there was um, a couple that came up to me, a kind of elder, elderly couple, and they had this vacant property, and they were they, they, they had it there. And I said to them, "Well, why don't you do something with it?" And they said they they would, but th their daughter had emigrated at the time, and she was in Australia, and they felt that if they sold the property or did something to it, that that would be sending out a message to her. That she, you know, they wanted her to come back and live in the property, so they were holding out hope. I suppose really that uh, that they wanted her to come back, and if they got rid of the property or did something with, with the property, that that would be it. They would be sit, more or less they'd lose lose her forever. So there is that huge emotional attachment to it. But look, I I agree. 
I, I think in the, in the midst of a housing crisis, it, it, it is morally wrong, you know, that, that you do have a vacant property, you know, and particularly if you have a property in a street next to someone else's property, because that vacant or derelict property is going, to, not only is it reducing in value, but it's also reducing the neighbours around you, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you can be, you can be a neighbour, but, you, but you're not being very neighbourly to, 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 to people. Uh, and I think that's, that's wrong, you know? I really, really do. Um, and I think you should have an obligation to think, bring that property back into use. But I, I do think it, it is going to take a carrot and a stick approach, the carrot being, being the grant and the stick being the vacant home tax. Is there any country in Europe or whatever that have, have, have oh, great yeah. success? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like in France and, and uh, even outside, I suppose, over in, in, in Canada as well. I mean, you know, with, they brought with, with in... taxation? Oh, yeah, with yeah. taxation. And, they've you know, in the first year they brought it in that they've saw a reduction of 20% in relation to the... So that we know it works. It, it, it does work, yeah. but it, it has to be pitched right. It has mm -hmm. to be at, at, at the appropriate level. Um, but the, the other thing as well... You know, we have to be mindful as well that there are very legitimate reasons why a property can be vacant. And what I mean by that is that you could get someone, an owner, who might be in a nursing home, yeah. uh, uh, through no fault of their own, and, you know, with, with, with the expectation and the desire to come back into their home. Uh, so they could be in the, in the nursing home for, for months. Um, and the other thing as well, I mean, I know, you know, people as well who have a property... They, um, they, they might have a property in Mayo or Galway or Scammon, but they're working in Dublin, mm -hmm. you know, or they're working abroad. So, you know, in the sense that the property is theirs, but they don't live in it um, all the time. The other thing as well, and, I, and you know, we talk about vacant property, but, but one of the, the issues I'm seeing more and more as well is, is the under underutilising of stock. And what I mean by that is that people who are living in properties but they might have, it might be a three or four bedroom per property, but you get um, someone on their own. And I think that's an issue we have to look at, you know? Um, if we can try and encourage those people, and I, and I don't, I hate the word downsizing. I, I, it, it has to be right-sizing. It has to be right-sizing for them and, and for the individuals. Because I, as you said yourself, Katrina, I mean, I think there are about 175,000 people between the ages of 18 and 49 that are still, you know, living at home or living with their parents. And they're the people who don't show up yeah. on, on any register. But there's another know? version of that as well. I mean, there's a lot of people in their 60s, in their 70s, who still have the house that they bought or built yeah. when they're in their 20s, early 30s, a massive house. Yeah. And their children can't get a house, and they want to try and do a deal with the children. And there's all kinds of taxation issues around that, and inheritance tax, and all, or taxation issues around that. Um, and then there's no word, like, beyond that again, then there's very few retirement villages for some, some yes. of these people want to live, live, move from the big old house, but want to stay in the community because they exactly. know their friends here, they're exactly. everywhere, yeah. exactly. and if they have a nice little community, they can retire and yeah. pass it on. So that part of the market is also, they're being under, you've uh, served, and it's yeah. causing it ripples further down the, the line as well for younger people. You know, Absolutely. So. I think for me, the... Um, this kind of, I, don't, I know you don't want to say downsizing, but I don't mind saying it. <laughs> because it is what people come to me going, we're getting pressured to downsize. Older people, property ownership in Ireland is such a minefield and it's reserved for so few that I feel like kind of scapegoating the people who finally got to own their own houses isn't very fair. I think a lot of people, especially my parents' age, 60s and 70s, who are in bigger houses, who fought their whole lives either to pay them off at the council or to get mortgages or build the houses themselves, I think the government can do something that doesn't involve just ripping people out of the houses they're in. The same as with this, um, the charging people who own derelict houses. We've already seen there, these are very sentimental reasons, very soft, kind-hearted reasons why a lot of people still have these houses. And instead of penalising them and getting more money into the exchequer, why not incentivize them? Why not say to them, look, you're not going to have to pay tax on the sale. So you, because I know a lot of farmers, I deal with farmers a lot, 
And when farmers sell houses that are on their land, they lose maybe 30, 40% of the money. So they're just sticking 30% on top of it and going, well, this is why this 70,000 euro house, I want 110,000 or whatever for it. You're going, it's, it's what happens. And I think just maybe encouraging people and incentivizing getting the derelict or the, the vacant houses rid of will be better than just slapping fees on people the whole time. Because a lot of the time people aren't doing up these houses because they can't afford to do exactly. them up, you know? And, and we've had the discussion about over-regulation and mm -hmm. making it really difficult for people to afford to renovate. Yeah. Well, look, unfortunately, we have to stop. I mean, we could go on for God. another hour <laughs> with all of this. <laughs> and I'm sure all three of you have many other things to say. But can I ask the audience to thank our three guests here? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. We learned a great deal from, from all three of you, and it's a, it's a fascinating and very important discussion. So let's hope we can continue to, to talk about these matters and yeah. fine-tune it. Maybe we should appoint you, all three of you, to a commission uh, <laughs> run by the government to, just, to work out how the hell we're going to solve these yeah. problems and just get it done. <laughs> Getting things done is very hard here. Mm -hmm. So enjoy the rest of your stay Thank you. in Thank Galway. You. Thank you. Thank and to the much. audience, Thank enjoy you. the rest Thanks of your Thank weekend. You. And... Uh, there, we're sold out for most of the talks at this stage, so I'm not going to be making my usual plea to go and buy tickets. <laughs> but those of you who have tickets, do come and enjoy the rest of First Thought. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.